Hello everyone and welcome back to day 34 of Bitwise where we code the complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, if you watched last stream you'll know we did a, uh, uh, a diversion stream to kind of uh, add a few compiler features that had been um, nagging me and other people who had been asking for them. And uh, one of them was, just to quickly review, one of them was um, Um, basically, I guess more uh, explicit namespace uh, syntax or semantics, so that rather than uh, you know in a fairly conventional way, so that um, when you import a package, you can you know use the package name as a prefix for accessing symbols inside that. Um, so uh, here we're we're using a combination for these test cases. We're using a combination of uh, of you know, kind of flat symbols that have been imported from that other namespace. So this is get char originally in libc, and it's been imported under gc. That was an old feature, but now you can also uh, type. Well, you can type libc get char um, uh, libc get char. Actually, I guess you can't because it's been renamed. But get char uh, no c dot get char because libc has been renamed to c on import. Um, and also, if you have a, um, you know, an import from from another package, you can sort of use this multiple dot notation. Um, that is the idea. So anyway, uh, we put that in last time, and uh, haven't found any issues with it since. And then we uh, we did sort of I guess maybe half of a feature um, for anonymous structs and unions, and I think we exercised it in the assembler um, where um, previously we had a a uh, for this tagged union for the token we had a um, a token data stru uh, a token data union and so every time you wanted to access you know val or stir you had to do token dot data dot val or token dot data dot stir um, but now you can have these um, anonymous subunions that essentially just uh, provide fields that are part of the flat namespace but um, that have a memory layout for for these fields specifically that um, that mim mimic how a union is laid out, right? Meaning that val and stir overlap, so you can only access one or the other depending on the kind. Um, so we were, we've been using this extensively in the Ion compiler, and uh, we added support for that to, or partly uh, added some support for it to um, to Ion as well. And um, the thing that was kind of missing there is that. Um, when we finish the stream, well, first, uh, the, the way the implementation changed a little bit is that um, when you now complete a type, so remember completion is when you, um, if you depend on a struct or a union in ion, it's possible to depend on it as just an incomplete type, meaning, you know, you're, you don't, you're not really accessing fields of that type or taking the size directly or indirectly. You're just kind of, you know, dealing with pointers to them, to that type or whatever. Um, but eventually if you use something, you know, where you acquire the size or knowing what the fields are and so on, you have to complete the type. This is what this function does. Um, and the way this works now is um, when you're completing an aggregate, so this could be either a struct or a union, um, rather than just completing the fields the way we were previously doing it, if you encounter a substruct or a subunion, you recursively complete that sub-aggregate and basically the fields get added to the overall list of type fields. Um, and so what this means is that, um, you know, this is kind of where we left off. What basically this means is that from from the superficial point of view, it's almost as if this doesn't exist. Like it just recursively visits all of these subunions and substructs, and just kind of adds all of the fields uh, to the uh, to the enclosing structure union. And um, and that's mostly fine, actually, um, <laughs> except for the pretty important thing is that it essentially means that from Ion's point of view, this whole thing just looks like a structure or union in terms of computing sizes and offsets and stuff like this. Now it mostly doesn't matter. 
like for example, all the code we just wrote um, like here would, would work actually the way we're using it because we're still relying on the C compiler to do to do everything on the back end. Um, but this would um, th th this uh, I guess this placeholder implementations uh, shortcomings would, would show up pretty dramatically if you tried to, for example, take si size of token. So um, if you do something like this, uh, size of token um, well or, or maybe maybe this is a better test. Um, this should be true that if you take the offset of val, it should equal the offset of stir. Um, but it does not because it's essentially treating it as a struct in this case. Um, so um, we have to basically, the first thing we'll do today is uh, get that to work properly so that uh, the layout of all these uh, sort of uh, these inline fields, whatever you want to call them, are essentially laid out in memory in terms of the offsets and the sizes as if you know they actually lived in a, a union um, so that's the first thing we're going to fix uh, before we dive into that um, i did want to quickly mention a kind of bug that had been lingering in some related code um, someone discovered it and it was a pretty stupid oversight but basically previously um, i think i added a regression test for it um, Yeah, previously, so if you look at this uh, struct T1 up here, uh, previously this would have computed it as size 5, which is incorrect, right? So it's certainly true that um, field, uh, field B is offset 4, and if there was a field C, it would be at offset 5. Um, but when you compute the, uh, the size of a struct, you, you don't just take sort of the you don't just take the final offset, essentially, uh, which is what I was doing. You have to round that up to the alignment of the struct as a whole. Um, not a fixed alignment, but the alignment of the struct as a whole. So in this case, uh, the alignment of the struct is 4 because the alignment of int is 4. Um, and I guess if I wanted to make it more agnostic, I would... Um, or Sorry, that's not true. But anyway, uh, yeah. So it wasn't rounding up the the final size based on the alignment. So this line was missing, and I just wanted to mention that because I had overlooked that previously. Um, alrighty. Um, so uh, off stream, I've thought about um, the cleanest way I can think of without completely overhauling how we do stuff, uh, a way of of doing all these offset computations while still having flat types when we're dealing with um, with the sub aggregates, how to do it. And one thing I came up with is um, so so the so the way the code works right now is you call this complete aggregate on the declarations aggregate, and again it visits the fields, it recursively visits any sub aggregates to build this list of type fields. Then it does some sanity checking, and finally it calls complete struct or complete union depending on what type of declaration we're dealing with. And um, I was thinking that um, one thing we could do um, to potentially uh, handle this is um, rather than completely flattening the um, rather than completely flattening things here, um, what we would basically do. Like, sorry, rather than flattening things at this level, what we could and building this flat list of type fields, what we could do is we could basically, um, like, ra rather than doing this recursively, we would basically fully, um, we would call these on, uh, on the sub aggregate essentially. So. So, so this thing here would generate a list of type fields. That would be probably the result of this. Um, we would then call whatever complete struct or complete union to build the complete type corresponding to that. Um, and then we would make an, an anonymous field, um, basically a field without a name. So normally we have names associated with the types, but these would be identified 
uh, as being special by being associated with the type we just completed from that substruct or subunion, but having no name, just having a null name. Um, and then that's it. And so we don't actually inline the names at this level. Um, so we have a one-to-one -one relationship between sort of the, you know, if you look at, uh, what was the thing we were looking at here? Like, for example, for this, this would basically correspond to something like this, like a non would correspond to a null name, right? Um, but it basically, it would it would instantiate and complete uh, the a type corresponding to this and associated with a null name. Um, and um, And then when we actually complete the type, like this stuff here, this would be responsible for basically flattening the namespace. Um, that's kind of what I had in mind. Um, so I don't know if that's the right idea, but it seems like it's one, like basically my, one of my main concerns here is trying to maintain some level of separation between what I have in type.c and what I have in resolve.c because type.c is not intended to be uh, it's intended to mostly just be related to sort of types in isolation without really worrying about, you know, for example, stuff like, you know, generating good error messages or knowing, detecting completion cycles and all this other stuff. So I'm trying to keep a, a split between these two, and I'm trying to think of the best way to do that uh, with uh, these anonymous substructs, and I think that maybe is one way to do it. So um, so let's think about wh what that might entail. Um, and so let's see. So right now, um, one thing we could do first of all is we could we could have this just return a list of fields like this. Um, actually, let me think about this. Um, So when this finishes, um, is it called decal kind? Probably, right? So I think you would move bunch of this stuff up here you would probably return the completed type so um, we have this stuff here Um, Hmm. Let me just think about that. We have to be cognizant of the whole completion cycle stuff when dealing with the sub aggregates as well. Like, for example, um, if I did, yeah, so that's going to be somewhat tricky, but like if I did something like this, for example, that is a completion cycle. Um, and should be handled as such. Um, there is no way to reference an anonymous struct or union except through a top-level named union, so I don't think we have to worry about completion cycles at that level. Um, so maybe that's not actually an issue there. Um, but all right, so, um, so here what we're doing is we're building we have an aggregate. We're building a list of type fields, 
recursively completing stuff and so on. Um, doing sanity checking. Um, finally completing the type based on those fields. Arguably, the kind of aggregate should be a uh, should be a feature of. I'm sure, it should be a kind field on the aggregate, so we don't have to do this stuff. Um, it's definitely. All right, yeah, this is definitely kind of overloading this a little bit. Um, but anyway. I mean, even if it compiles, it's not going to do the right thing, basically. Not quite do the right thing. I think the aggregate has a position as well, right? We can just use this. There shouldn't be a type. But... Oh, interesting. Maybe the way to do this correctly is that there is a kind here. Um, and then instead of having this sub subunion, um, you just have sub aggregate and then you distinguish um, based on the aggregate kind. Well, there's already something called aggregate none. Um, all right, yeah. And then for this, I think you just um, and then I guess we want to pass down the kind of thing. Sub aggregate, and then this is aggregate kind, and this is 
well, I guess we don't actually need to pass it down at this point because um, it's contained in the sub aggregate. And honestly, this should probably be one function as well now, now that I think about it. But um, let's just, for now, do it like this. Um, I think there's also one more thing that needs to get changed here because parse decal aggregate presumably calls, right, new decal aggregate. Right, so this needs to um, oh yeah, so this is a little bit annoying. Previously, we were signaling these things using this incomplete tag. Um, but if we do that, we don't know whether we have a struct or a union. Um, you know what, this should just be aggregate kind is at this level and then um, and then this function should be aggregate struct aggregate union and should be sub aggregate um, if item sub aggregate kind equals aggregate Right, this would be item sub aggregate equals aggregate struct um, We should probably add that as well. This is when we were passing it in. Um, 
no doing that so it's tight right so we we, we don't have so yeah one difference is that between the top level declaration level aggregate and the sub the anonymous sub aggregates is that they don't have a declaration associated with them. And so the way it works for declaration or declared sort of name declared uh, structs and unions is that you create an incomplete type that's sort of like a husk to be filled in later uh, once it's completed. Um, but for these, I think we have to um, kind of do that on the fly. Let me think here. Um. Oh God, did that, this is like the worst search and replace in the fricking universe. Um, No, and it has to be global as well. I forgot about that. Well, I guess if we just do it here, we can get the compiler to find the others. All right. Um, all right, here we go. So um, in type.c, there's whatever, is it type struct? Or what's that thing called? complete struct I guess it's incomplete right but it has to be associated with a symbol I think that can be null though. Um, so type incomplete um, null. And we set it to completing. Okay. All oh, right, because this is using the wrong. Oh no, that's not right. true. I guess yeah, no, I know what's happening. I'm passing in an implicit conversion here. Um, all 
yeah, I guess this really should be the decal kind since this is a decal level thing. Um, and then we just convert. All right, we still have to call it with the new. With the new thing. Okay, that's something else. This is where having stricter type checking. For C enums is handy. Okay, so something happened. Um, let me set a breakpoint here and see if we hit it. Oh, right, I guess it's not being exercised with test one. So actually, we should add some test cases to test one. That seems like an obvious thing to do. Um, and I mean, we can do like, we can actually copy some of that stuff from the assembler. You know, something like this. Right, so um, yeah, I was anticipating there were going to be some issues with type info. I think I'm going to temporarily uh, skip that. Um, just because I don't want to deal with it for this very moment. Okay, so um, you know you want to be able to do like, which won't work right now, but you want to be able to do like token int val equals forty two um, token kind token stir stir equals hello something like this, and it's going to complain about those fields being absent um, because, right, okay. So now I want to see if I can hit this. So yeah, that, that, that should be for that, yeah, val and stir thing. Um, now let's see if this actually completes correctly. Yep, looks reasonable. Okay. So the plan now is, um, well, you want to push a uh, sub aggregate type. You want to do something like this.
Um, okay, so it actually doesn't, I, I was hoping maybe it would bomb out in the type completion. But anyway, um, so let me just show you what I have in mind here. So if I, so this is when, this would be when completing the token struct. Um, so field one is kind, etc., And it does have an existing type that it's filling in. Um, and so it's gonna go and complete this. And this should actually have the right size and alignment for everything. But of course, because now it's just filling stuff in, but, but uh, it's not inlining the fields, which is what you want. Um, and so the plan I had is, Basically what I want to do is when you're visiting the fields, you want to have some logic that looks like this. Um, if this is, I think it's just called none name, right? Oops, where did I go? Okay, I guess, let's scoop it up. You know, if there's a name, then you do something like this. Um, But basically, you want to, uh, how to put it, I want to recursively visit the fields that have a null name and, um, and copy their fields into my fields at that position using my current kind of offset as a base. Um, because at the point where we encounter that anonymous field, We've already accumulated, you know, a certain offset, um, and so we want to use that as a base. Um, and so, I think one thing that has to change a little bit is that. Um, Remember, what does memdupe do? Okay, so I think we probably don't need. Because we can make this our own copy. Um, And I guess to start, let's just emulate the old logic um, by saying, you know, buff push, new fields, it, um, just get the test to pass again because I want to make sure I didn't break existing code right okay it's reasonable um, if it name do this, else, um, uh, so what do you want to call this? You want to call it, like you, you basically, you call, so there's some function uh, that you call on, um, you call it with the type, the offset, and the new fields, because you wanted to add it in there. 
Um, oh, and the whatever sub aggregate type. Um, I mean, I don't know what to call it, but like uh, fill uh, inline type fields, maybe. Um, dust type. Uh, source type. Well, no, I guess it. it, it uh, Add type fields. So there's a type. There is an offset. And there are. There's, I guess, something like this. And I guess this should be the first one because it's kind of the destination of the operation. Um, and so I think what you do is. Um, well, first let's assert that this is actually a fully completed structure union. Um, let me just remind myself what that thing is called. So, okay, it's just fields and num fields. Um, Um, so grab this one, I guess we, we, we push a new field corresponding to, um, you know, the same name, certainly, let me just remind myself what the fields are, name, type, and offset, right, so. Uh, type fields. But the offset is not just the base offset, it's the field offset plus that kind of running offset. Um, I guess what we can, we have to update that afterwards anyway, so maybe we should do it here. So this is the running offset, so this for example starts out as zero maybe, or it could be zero if it's the beginning of the containing struct. Uh, and then we do this. Um, Yeah, you also shouldn't do this. Um, I think what you should do is like 
Type field, field. Uh, it, don't want to overwrite it in place. Let's set the field offset to that. Um, set the field alignment. Oh, that's not true, yeah. Yeah, you know, we can, we can kind of keep the code as it was, to be honest. Anyway, so then this would be at type fields, new fields. Um, I guess the type is type is just the field type, and um, and the offset is however big the size has become at this point. Um, Something like this, I believe. Um, oh, aggregate dot fields. Let's see. Um, so it's aggregate dot fields. Well, I guess we can also just make this. Uh, okay. So code see, seems to compile. Um, including that code, let's go and see what this does. Okay, it's definitely it's a real issue. Um, now the thing we should check is the static asserts. Like uh, we should check that the offset of val is the same as the offset of stir, for example. Okay, and it isn't. Um, let me set a breakpoint there so we can see. What happened? Um, I guess at this point maybe it's too hard to see exactly what went wrong. Um, I guess let's just let's just walk through this stuff. Oh, actually, this plus stuff assumes it's dealing with a struct. So that's actually not correct. I'm sorry. Um, I think what it should do is it should set this to... Yeah, this is not right. Um, because when you completed that type, it already took that into account. So it already did that. And I think what it should do is just add um, add the size of that thing. Because when you're doing this computation, keep in mind the the this anonymous sub aggregate thing. This thing has already been completed, so all the field offsets for those 
fields have already been filled in. And so if it was a struct, they were laid out sequentially. If it was a union, they were laid out uh, on top of each other. Um, and so by the time you get to this, um, and probably at this point, we shouldn't really do it like that. Um, No, actually, let's not even do that. It makes no sense. Let's not even return anything. Let's just do that here. So this is the offset, and here we just um, take care of business. Like so. Um, we have to I think one thing we need to do is this needs to happen like this in both cases Actually, let me think about this. We also need to take that, do that for the, for the alignment. So probably do this. I think we even do this. I think this is the only difference. This is the only difference. Everything else is the same. Which then means when we do the same thing for do the same thing for unions. Wait, let me think if this makes sense the way we do this here. The overall size is whatever. This should always be the same. Then in this case, we set the offset to zero and just push that solitary field. In this case, we have multiples. And that seems reasonable to me. So the way you would test that is like, you could, I mean, I don't know. Let's do something slightly weird. Something like this. Okay, that's interesting. Is, okay, so this, I think, exposed a bug. What if I do this? Okay, so even that. Exposed an issue. Let me think about why that is.
So I guess now this case would be getting hit, right? That's the problem. So this type here, let's see what the fields are. All right, so this is for the anonymous substruct, right? There's one of them, etc. So at this point, we have uh, we already have a size of eight. Which I guess is at, yeah after getting to that point. Oh no, yeah, this is right. This is after. This is not correct. Um, this should always be zero. I think this is incorrect too, right? Because this has already done the rounding up. Let's see. Yeah, this this is wrong. This is wrong. Um should be done after. Um, I don't know, let's add some weird size field here. Yeah, that still works. Um, and I guess I would, how big should this be? This is going to be four, four, eight. This gets a line, so it's 16. Um, plus two, but then it has to be 24 because it gets aligned to the max of anything, which is, I think it's this. Right. All right. Um, let's return to the type info and get that working. I think the main thing uh, the main thing is That's interesting. If you don't have an associated symbol, should types with no ex So okay. Then we should also be able to look at whatever type info table the token. Well, all right. This is always going to be correct because it's sourced from C data. But the important point is it doesn't there should be some associated types that are left out here. I'm having no symbol. Okay, yeah, this is definitely wrong. Um,
if type symbol, then else. Uh, if um, if you don't have a symbol and you are a this is a little bit ad hoc, but I think this at least is valid. Okay, so then we have this that we want, but if you look at the token, type info, those anonymous types don't show up here. All right. Um, Let me just take another glance at the code we wrote for sanity check. Um, let me test some other stuff just to make sure we didn't break it. All right, let me see if anyone has comments. Um, this is probably fine for now. I think this is more or less all we need. Uh, all right, so let me just answer a question from chat. Someone's asking, what's the plan for the next few weeks? We're working on the simulator. We still need to create our own HDL as, as well. Will creating the sim the HDL be the start of the hardware FPGA section? How do we plan to take the simulator in the near term? So um, in the near term, my plan for the simulator is basically um, to put some of the debugging features into better shape and then to um, um, the, the the other thing we need to do, it's not strictly necessary for the near term, but it's something we should do sooner than later, is have a more general simulation framework where you can co-simulate. So right now we have memory mapped I.O. in the simulator, which is purely kind of reactive in the sense that when you issue a load or a store, something, something can happen in response. But you also need to have true concurrency where, for example, um, I mean, like... Um, if you're doing video output or something like that that runs on 60 hertz, right? Like, and it has V blank timing and scan line timing and all this other stuff. All these other concurrent things need to be scheduled. So right now we're assuming the only thing that's really ticking is the, the CPU core, but you might need have multiple CPU cores and multiple other units and like things like timers, for example, like um, uh, things like that. So we need to uh, add more debugging features add uh, some basic support for kind of simulating not just a single core, but a, a system of, of different uh, concurrent units. Um, and if you, you can do that in a simple way, right? Like it's just standard scheduling stuff. Um, everyone says when they want to run and you always pick the next thing to run and run it for that many cycles or whatever. Um, or you could do cycle level interleaving or whatever, depending on accuracy requirements. Um, so that's the basic thing I want to do. Uh, then I want to use that to write the fourth system, um, which I plan to start on on Friday. Um, regarding the HDL stuff, uh, yeah, it, the, the HDL development and things related to that are probably, yeah, that, that is going to basically be the first part of the 
the kind of the, the pure hardware design section. I hope to get to that maybe in another week or so. Um, and uh, we, we were, we're going to be doing that as a d embedded domain specific language in Python. Uh, I did one like that before and I have a pretty good plan for how I want to do that. And so as we develop the HDL, it will be done in a very piecemeal fashion where uh, we won't do the full thing before we do anything interesting with it. We'll do something uh, starting out that's basically like gate level, simple gate level design without any fancy features. And already at that level, I can show some stuff about how to design uh, not, you know, design bigger things by composing smaller gates and stuff uh, in a structured way, um, and and so on. And for uh, for the HDL, there's going to be basically, I guess, two basic kinds of simulation. Um, there's going to be one that's performance targeted, which will generate C code via probably via Verilator. Um and uh, which which takes uh, Verilog code and, and generates a, a fast cycle accurate simulator from it. Uh, and so we'll have basically a Verilog backend that we can feed to Verilator or we can feed to, you know, Silinx's tools or some other vendor specific uh, Verilog to FPGA tools. Uh, and then we're also going to have a sort of a slow simulator for uh, for debugging basically that runs directly from the HDL netlists. Um, and the goal of having something like the, um, you know, the simulator we're working on is that if you have a CPU implemented in different forms, so you have, you know, on the, you have something like our simple behavioral core that we implemented here, which is not, doesn't have really any microarchitecture uh, emulated. It's just, uh, you know, implementing the spec in a straightforward way. Uh, but if you have a simulation at this level, you can co-simulate it and verify it against um, you know a core specified in HDL simulated um, in some form. You can compare states at various points to make sure they match up where they should. Um, so anyway that's the that's the plan for the next several months even. Um, but HDL stuff starting soon. But I do want to finish I do want <clears throat> I do want to get the the simulator in uh, so the simulator to the point where we can implement that fourth system in assembly and simulate it and debug it and so on and feel like we did something useful there before we move to hardware. Um, so that's coming soon. This compiler stuff was because I was kind of wanting to catch up on, on some of these features that were starting to annoy me uh, that we didn't have them anyway. All right, so let's see here. Uh, yeah, let me, let me just do another read through of this code um, before I call it done for now. Complete aggregate. Um Let's see. All oh, right, so that's one thing we have to. Yeah, I forgot about that. Um, or yeah, let me let me show you the bug. Um, right now, if you have like if you have something like this, it's going to detect a. Uh, it's going to detect duplicate fields, but right now it wouldn't detect this. Like it would detect it in the C code, right? Um, but not in the ion code. So that's a bug. Um, and that's a, uh, that's a legacy of the old way of doing things. So the way we're going to do it now is um, we're going to Construct the type which is responsible for doing all of the field in line, uh, you know, all the field flattening and stuff through these anonymous substructs and whatnot. Uh, and so, what we're going to do is we're going to validate things at the type level rather than before constructing the type. Go 
also just do this, I guess. And you can see now it's detecting duplicate fields across these multiple substruct subunion levels. I think that's it. All right. <clears throat> Let me just also glance at this one more time. So if we have a named field, then fill in the offset based on how far we've gotten, and then add that solitary one. Otherwise, visit it like that. Then in either case, we do it like this. Same thing here, always at offset zero, single field. Otherwise, add all of these fields starting at offset zero. All right, looks reasonable. All right, I might call that a day, even though we've only been going for, I guess I started the stream a little earlier today, so we've only, almost gone an hour and a half. Um, but yeah, so, so so to sort of comment on what people are saying in, in the chat, my experience with force is that it, my, my real experience with fourth is actually also quite limited. But yeah, the reason I think it would be cool to do is that it's one of those things which, uh, yeah, first off, it just is, is cool in its own right. But also given kind of the state of our software stack, um, it's something that you can implement in assembly. Like the, the, you wouldn't really like you can implement it in C as well, but actually a lot of the cool implementation techniques you can't really do in C, like for threaded code and stuff like that, which are staples of fourth implementations. So um, I, you know, I, I, I think I know, like I haven't done a ton of real programming in fourth, but I kind of know how the implementation techniques go. And so I think it would be cool to, uh, to explore those uh, since I think we could do a good job even given the state of our assembler and our simulator. You don't you don't need much more than basic um, you know terminal I/O UART style stuff um, and a decent assembler to do that kind of thing. Uh, but of course, it can scale up to do more, right? Like if we add graphics, you can write a game in Fourth if you want to. Um, and Fourth is has some surprisingly powerful abstraction facilities. Um, 
given how simple it is. Um, it's painful for a lot of stuff, in my opinion, but um, it's it's very cool. It's kind of a something that if you're kind of a low level programmer, I think uh, you deserve to to think about and, and, and expose yourself to a little bit. So yeah, should be good. I, yeah, and regarding bootstrapping, you're right. I mean, like people do use Forth for that. <clears throat> There's actually um, something that's not really in use anymore, but there was a project called Open Firmware, which uh, Apple used in, when did they stop using it? They were using it for a while, um, but it was basically a sort of portable BIOS-like solution, um, but it had a fourth shell at, as the basic interface, and a lot of firmware was written in fourth as well, or could be written in fourth. Uh, that was a pretty cool project. I know it was used in the one one laptop per child project, but it had industry backing as well. I think some of the earlier Apple computers used it um, from maybe from the early 2000s. I can't remember when they dropped it. So it's yeah, it's cool for a lot of sort of semi bare metal stuff. Um, I don't know how I, you know. To be honest, I don't think we will really be bootstrapping stuff ourselves on it. Like I plan to do fun projects with it just to for fun. Um, but I don't think we'll build like our own stack on top of fourth. I think the fourth stuff is more interesting just as an example of something you can do at this very uh, basic stage of yeah of bootstrapping. Um, but we won't necessarily build our, our, our the rest of our stack on top of fourth. But yeah, it's definitely something you can do if you wanted to. Uh, and, you know, I, would, I would check out Open Firmware if you're interested. That's kind of a cool thing to, to check out. All right, I think that's it for today. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for spending two streams on compiler stuff, but um, I couldn't motivate myself to do this off stream. And so I figured uh, this would be a good opportunity to get these features done and also have some stream content. Uh, and people have been bugging me about this. And I was also starting to feel the pain myself, uh, especially the anonymous substruct and subunion stuff. Um, so we may do a few others like this in the future if I, if I get annoyed sufficiently and can't get myself to do it off stream. But um, uh, I plan to go back and start working on the fourth stuff and the simulator stuff on next stream this Friday. So stay tuned for that. Um, thanks for hanging out and I'll see everyone next time.